By the 70s, the girls had grown up. The classy uptown look had evolved into something more glitzy and cabaret, especially here in Britain, where everyone loved our next girl group. I think it's the nails and the hair, the bouffant wigs and the, and the red lips that come around the corner before you do. But even their biggest fan, Prince Charles, didn't know what was really happening behind the gowns and lip gloss. We were told, you sing and smile and everything else will be taken care of. The Three Degrees had actually been going since the early 60s, following the girl group route to the, well, the middle of the road. They were created by Richard Barrett, a veteran of the music business, who found three teenage girls who he knew he could mould. And because Richard had already been in groups, he knew what he was doing. I was, was more or less a blank canvas. He was our legal chaperone on tour, because we were 17, just finished high school, and touring Boston and Revere for the Mafia, and, um, and learning how to not say things you shouldn't say. Let me tell you about Barrett. Richard Barrett was a studier. He saw what Barry Gordy did. When Barry's groups would go out, they were tutored, they were shampooed, they were choreographed, they were chaperoned. So, so Richard said, this is what I'm going to do with these girls. Discipline. Discipline. He was probably the toughest manager I ever saw, ever. I think the girls were frightened of him. His temper sometimes got a bit out of hand. We were always constantly made to think that you can always be better. Barrett knew exactly where he was taking the girls, out on the lucrative circuit of cabaret and supper club, chicken in a basket and money in the bank. I went to Vegas with them and they opened up for, for Engelbert Humperdinck and it was really impressive seeing them on stage. The very gorgeous three degrees. The grooming we had, the working in Vegas, opening for acts like Engelbert Humperdinck or Frank Sinatra or people like that, that was a learning ground that you just cannot buy. Stevens feel a little bit polished. They not only did their hits, but they came out with show tunes. It's like the Supremes in Vegas. When they came out, it was pizzazz. In the audience one night were Gamble and Huff, producers behind the Philadelphia sound, like Motown, but more spangly. One day, they happened to see the Three Degrees in Cabaret. They came out with the top hats and the canes and the routines. It wasn't really that big on records yet, but they worked. So it was an opportunity for, for Gamble and Huff to come up with a great song and a great album for them. Ooh, ha, precious okay. moments. When will I see you? After 10 years playing to people who were having their dinner, the Three Degrees finally had their first international hit in 1974. Then it came into England. It was like number one here in England. And then it came to the States and was number one. So this was a big, a giant record. When will our hearts be the girl group sound had grown up. These weren't girls, but women. But even this group had its own Diana Ross. The Three Degrees as a group were brilliant, but Sheila, she had everything. Ba -bop, ba -bop, voice to die for. All of a sudden, the English men are being introduced to black women of a different caliber. They'd never seen black women looking like that before. And I think it's the nails and the hair, the bouffant wigs and the, and the red lips that come around the corner before you do. 70s Britain couldn't get enough of the three degrees. TV-wise, I, I had a field day with the girls. A, they were very professional, very, very slick. Welcome back to the three degrees. The three degrees! The three degrees! The three degrees! At that time, Saturday Night TV could command an audience of uh, 23, 24 million. And 
and they certainly haven't hit here a long, long time after America. You know, I mean, they became part of the establishment here. When they went on stage, and it, I went to quite a few gigs, uh, you know, Manchester, you could hear, I'm sitting in the audience as a, an anonymous uh, chap, you know, just watching the show. Ladies and gentlemen, to kick us off tonight, a really wonderful act. Three beautiful young ladies go by the name of the Three Degrees. <laughs> And, and you'd hear comments on the table, eh, bloody hell, he said, I'd like some of that, lad. It was like Hollywood come to Manchester, and it was something that they'd only seen on TV. It was a Vegas polished act performing in front of them whilst they're tucking into chicken in a basket. Ah, the 70s. Women's liberation, it's cool. I mean, it's got its good points and its bad points. We got a harder time in the 70s from, from feminists. I just want to be loved, yeah? And that's when I become your slave. Times have changed, but at the time, it was a beautiful lyric, and I love singing it. I like her being a The group had loyal fans and royal fans. Buckingham Palace let it be known that the band were official favourites of Britain's most eligible bachelor. Prince Charles's favourite group was a coup for the girls. I'm not sure whether the Royal Seal of Approval helped our career as much as it helped Prince Charles's career. I think Prince Charles has done very well out of the street cred we gave him doing the Royal Boogie, you know. So it was all fun. He was a bachelor. Um, going to the palace, being invited was just so wonderful. But behind the scenes, manager Richard Barrett was still running the show. And far from being free and single, Sheila was closer than ever to her manager. He was my lover, my first lover. And I always felt that I was on the fence between the girls and Richard, and I was. So I had to keep him happy and keep them happy. And it drove me crazy. So when it got to the point where I felt the relationship was being abusive, I just split. Forced to choose between her man and her band, Sheila sided with the girls. They sacked Barrett in 1981 and for the first time since they started out, had to look after themselves. Once we lost Richard Barrett, it was like, okay, now whatever you didn't know, you're going to have to learn. And we did have to learn it quite quickly. Sheila was now married with kids and settled in England full time, but she was finding it hard to keep the group together. I couldn't handle the pressure anymore. I was married, I had a husband, I had children to raise. They were clinging to the nanny instead of me, and I'm paying all the bills. I'm saying, wait a minute, something's wrong with this picture. I need to get off the treadmill. And I went to my doctor, and he said, you're on the sliding slope. You can go that way or the other. I chose to go the other and not to become an alcoholic. Clearly, that was a sign that I needed to leave the group. It was time. I got a phone call from Helen saying that Sheila is on the phone and I think we need to have a talk. And that's how it came about. I was very upset because I thought, you know, it should have been a bit more personal. We must have been in shock because they said, OK, well, OK, then bye. Believe me, trying to find somebody to replace her was absolutely a nightmare. It's the same old story. You care, you don't love me. But they did replace her, and Valerie Holiday's version of The Three Degrees is still going, back on the cabaret circuit. Most people today don't realise what groups go through to become performers, because all they hear about is the time that you have after you get a hit record. After you get a hit record, the world changes. Everybody's doors are open to you. You, you walk into Club 54 at the time. You do, get out of the limousine. You don't have to even wait around. Um, you get, you're on the A-list for everything. You, you just, you kind of take it for granted. And you think it's always going to be that way. 
it isn't always that way. And the trick is to kind of ride the storm and, and the treat both imposters just the same. If you can do that, you'll have longevity in the business. If you can't, you're going to be a, a one-night stand, really. But um, the, the grooming we had, the working in Vegas, the working um, in Miami, the opening for opening acts, opening for acts like Engelbert Humperdinck or Myron Cohen or Buddy Greco or Frank Sinatra or people like that, that was a learning ground that you just cannot buy. To, to stand in the wings, stand in the wings and watch these guys perform, and they would just take the audience and just milk them and work it. And I said to Myron Cohen once, he's a Jewish comedian, uh, American comedian, and I said, "How do you take the audience and you just?" He, before I could finish, he said. You're honorary Jewish. This is how you do it. You go out there and you smack them upside the head and you give it all. You, I've been doing that ever since. So it's like you have to take the bull by the horns. And it's people like that who give you confidence to say a few words here and there. You're doing the right thing. Don't be late. Worrying about what clothes you're going to wear. We missed a whole opening by not deciding on what gowns to wear. And when we got down there, it, it was on to the next act. You know, so you learn the hard way, but it's the only way to really to learn the craft, if you treat it as a craft, if you treat it as something that's a hobby, then get out of it.